Hi, welcome to Logging Heads TV and Culturally Determined. I'm your host, R.A. Cohen-Wade, and my guest today is James Geary. Uh, could you introduce yourself, James? Sure. I'm James Geary, the author of Wit's End, What Wit Is, How It Works, and Why We Need It. There it is. There it <laughs> is. So, Wit's End. It's a, it's a really good cover that kind of captures the um, high and low combination <laughs> of, of the book with the, uh, with the googly eye there. That was the idea. Uh, so thanks for coming on today. Um, so I guess the first question is, why did you want to write a book all about wit? <laughs> um, well, I think um, I've been interested in wit for a long time. I have written previous books about aphorisms and, and metaphor. And I think wit, in writing those books, I'm always kind of trying to figure out what is the um, you know, what's the essence of aphorisms or what's, what's the essence, essence of, of, of metaphor. And I think they are all, uh, they're all related to, to wit in some form. And for aphorisms, aphorisms, for example, are witty philosophical sayings, which work primarily through metaphor. And the reason they can be so short as aphorisms uh, must be, is that they, they use metaphors to convey meaning. Stanislav Letts is, Fantastic metaphor, no snowflake in an avalanche ever feels responsible. <laughs> That's a great aphorism, and it's a complete, completely a metaphor. There's nothing directly, his meaning is never directly stated in that, um, in that aphorism. And I think what metaphor and wit have in common is they both involve making novel, surprising connections between unrelated things. And as I was kind of in researching and writing those books, which which have been a lifelong obsession for me, metaphor and aphorisms, I gradually came to realize that the real kind of operating system for both those things is wit. And what I found so interesting about wit is that we tend to think of it primarily as having to do with a, with a sense of humor and being funny. But wit what I discovered, wit is, is is actually more a state of mind than a, than a sense of humor, and it's sort of like an intellectual, instinctive intellectual ingenuity that, like metaphor, involves making uh, or spotting, identifying uh, patterns in things and the way things can be connected and, and recombined, and that can be funny in the sense of a punchline or a pun, um, but it doesn't have to be funny. And I think wit is. Um, involved in all kinds of creative endeavors, scientific discoveries, uh, um, entrepreneurial activities, inventions, also humor, um, but also the visual arts. You can be visually witty. Um, you don't have to be only, wit is, is not only verbal. It can be visual, it can be physical, uh, it can be intellectual. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> um, yeah, so there's a lot there at some points I want to touch on uh, later, especially um, wit versus humor or funniness. Um, but I want to talk a little bit about the um, kind of layout of the book, which is unusual in that every chapter is in a uh, different style that is often a kind of, not parody, but you, you so you have like, I think the first chapter is um, a uh, in the style of Alexander Pope and his um, yeah. heroic couplets. And then you have a scientific article in there, and you have a conversation between uh, Diderot and Madame de Stal, if that's how you say her name. And, that's so, right. and it, you're switching every every chapter into a new, like a completely new kind of style. And the, and the uh, graphic design of the book switches as well. And most of the chapters uh, look different between the fonts or the layout. Um, so that so it's, that's definitely you know non standard for a book. How did you decide that you wanted to use this unusual format? Yeah, I um, I originally tried to write the book sort of conventionally, you know, chapter by chapter. And my idea was to write very short chapters about one aspect of, of, of wit and that that chapter would sort of organically lead to the next chapter and so on and so on in the spirit of wit being the ability to make these kind of surprising connections. Um, but as I <laughs> attempted to do that, I realized I was making the huge mistake that, um, is the worst mistake you can make when you're writing about or talking about humor or wit. I was explaining things too much. And as a result, 
um, the, the the whole kind of spirit of the thing just wasn't it wasn't clicking and it was falling apart and I was actually killing the wit rather than um, celebrating it. So um, I had the the idea to try to show what wit is to try and make the book witty itself as well as being about wit and to do that by um, because I identify I had uh, identified these different styles and different kinds of wit to do that by writing each chapter in a totally different style and Alexander Pope I started with him because he his essay on man his great poem is is really all about um, wit and about wit as I understood or as I came to understand it as a uh, wit as an intellectual ability and then I had the idea, well, if I'm talking about or writing about verbal wit, I should write that in the form of a dialogue. And basically that's the scene from a play. Um, and it's a kind of uh, Denis Diderot and Madame de Stael um, have engaging in witty banter back and forth about wit. And if I'm writing about the uh, how wit works in the brain, why not write that like a scientific paper? And, and <laughs> um uh, there's a there's a rap song. I think uh, rap some of the rap lyrics are some of the most the wittiest and most inventive um, popular popular music lyrics out there. So I wrote um, a chapter as a as a rap song. Um, there's the spirituality of wit, um, and I wrote that in, in the style of a sermon. And um, there's also visual wit. So I wrote that in the style of um, an art historical lecture that someone would be giving. Um, uh, at, at some kind of public place. And so to make that kind of conceit uh, complete in the book, we decided that each chapter would be designed in accordance with um, how it's written. So the, the chapter that's written as a play for a scene from a play is when you look at it on the page, it looks like it's a, a play. The scientific paper is designed in those two columns, the way scientific papers okay. are presented. Um, the sermon has very kind of elaborate um, drop caps at certain parts, just like you would see in a Bible or some other kind of um, book of scripture. The rap song is written in a very cool kind of um, typewritery like font. Um, so each chapter, I tried to, um, in each chapter, have the, the discussion of which show what wit is and not just talk about what wit is. And it's not intended, none of those chapters or none of those styles are intended to be a parody at all. Um, if anything, they're, they're meant to show my admiration for those particular styles and those particular um, stylists. So in doing that, I wasn't trying to be like satirical or um, to parody the originals on which those are based, but to use those as a kind of example and template to... Um, you know, kind of hold my, my own discussion of wit. Uh, yeah, I, I'm sure you're familiar with uh, the, the aphorism about um, trying to dis dissect humor is like dissecting a frog. Yeah. Um, you know, the, you kill the frog and you don't really learn anything. Um, so, so you have avoided, I think you've avoided that fate. <laughs> um, of That's good to hear. <laughs> yeah, losing, not like the forest of the hills, but like, yeah, you know, humor is inherently silly and lighthearted and, you know, kind of, pulling apart too much uh can ruin it in a way um mm -hmm. so the first substantial chapter is about puns yes and puns i guess are like the most maligned form of humor or considered yeah just like i mean i would think about it like you know you think like oh like you know Grandpa Wooly, really, he likes puns. Like, that's just the thing he's into. It's just like, oh, like, kind of weird people like puns. Or if, <laughs> if if someone says a pun during a speech, like, everyone will be, like, you know, like, groan. And that's kind of an accepted thing to do about in reaction to a pun. But you, you stick up for puns and try to um, rehabilitate them and kind of make <laughs> it the, uh, yeah, like, the starting place for the, for the rest of the book. So what can you give us some thoughts on puns and why we should take them more seriously than, than maybe we do? Yeah, I've never understood why puns have such a bad reputation. They're they're often considered um, described as the, the the lowest form of wit, but I actually think puns are the highest form of wit because I think they embody um, the essence of what wit is. And what wit is is, like I said earlier, it's making connections. It's not necessarily making a joke. 
like I said, wit, wit can be funny, but it doesn't have to be funny. But what wit always involves is making a connection. And in a pun, you have two words that have different meanings, but they sound the same, and you're making that connection. And, um, you know, some of the, <laughs> I don't, my defense of puns is not that all puns are like brilliant intellectual exercises, but that, that they are demonstrating the essence of wit and the essence of creativity by embodying that ability of the human mind to make connections. And I think that's the essence of creativity. So a very simple pun like, um, if you've seen one shopping center, you've seen them all you've seen a mall. So you may groan when you hear that <laughs> pun, but it's actually a, a, a pretty brilliant demonstration of human creativity to take two really, really different things and based on the similarity of sound to, to, to bring them together. And the other thing that I think is unique about puns and, and speaks directly to um, wit is that I think people generally we tend to think of witty people as like like you were saying and people who make puns as weird or different or that wit is some kind of special ability that only people like oscar wilde or mark twain or dorothy parker have but i think in puns you see that wit is something that everybody has because what happens in a pun is that the person who makes the pun and the person who gets the pun understands the pun they're engaging in exactly the same kind of intellectual endeavor. They are making it the identical connections. So the person who makes the pun between shopping centers and mall, and you've seen a mall, is uh, made that connection first and kind of initiated it. But the people who hear the pun make exactly that same connection. And regardless of whether you're making the pun or hearing it, you're making that connection. Mm -hmm. And so that means the person who makes the pun and the person who gets the pun are equally witty because they're, they're making that same connection. One is doing it in one direction and another is doing it in a, in a different direction, but the connection is the same. Mm -hmm. And that's what I think is a demonstration of how everybody is witty and how the human mind, even if we groan when we, we realize what the pun is, has this innate, instinctive, really, really fast, quick ability to make connections. And like I said, that's the essence of wit. And I think puns demonstrate that in daily life, um, whether you happen to appreciate the pun or not. Yeah, that's interesting. It makes me think that like uh, puns are kind of like a, a democratic form of, for a viewer because uh, pretty much anyone can understand them. And, uh, Lots of people can make them. You can make up your own pretty easily. Uh, you know, children are invited to enjoy them, like on the wrappers of Laffy Taffy, um, you know, uh, candies. I remember there will always be like a really bad joke. Yeah. <laughs> and you unwrapped it and it would usually be some kind of pun based. Pun yeah, basic. silly puns like that. They're, um, they're great. But also, you know, uh, uh, William Shakespeare was a huge fan of puns. And um, you have a blurb on the back of your book uh, from Harold Bloom, the uh, revered. Uh, English and Humanities professor at Yale, and he has two favorite characters in the Shakespearean canon, uh, Hamlet and Falstaff, and they are like the most punning <laughs> characters uh, the, in the, you know, of all of all Shakespeare's characters, and um, I believe Hamlet's first line in the play Hamlet is a pun, um, a little more than kin and less than kind, yeah. um, talking about uh, Claudius. So... Yeah. And, you know, Hamlet is put forward as the, you know, like, genius of Western literature. <laughs> but he's, and he, and he uses, uh, you know, this kind of humor, like, hundreds of times throughout throughout the play. And the puns are, in Shakespeare, you're absolutely right. That the average number of puns in a Shakespeare play is 78. And some plays have upwards of 170, 200 puns. And... Um, you know, James Joyce, uh, another favorite of, of Harold Bloom, his book Finnegan's Wake is 600 plus pages of puns, basically multilingual puns in Joyce's case. But if you look at both Joyce and Shakespeare or the use of puns in literature more, more generally, those puns are not always jokes. Um, and in fact, probably the minority of the puns in Shakespeare would be considered funny or groaners, like we would describe uh, puns. They have to do with making an intellectual connection. Um, I cite one from King Lear, 
where the fool in in King Lear is making a pun on an egg and um, a crown. And he's he actually makes four different puns <laughs> on the resemblance between an egg and a crown. And each of those four different puns pertains to a different aspect of King Lear's foolishness. <laughs> this is coming from the fool who's calling King Lear a fool um, uh, in dividing his kingdom, kingdom the, the way that he did among his daughters. And there's nothing funny about any of those four puns. They are all really pointed really brilliant, perceptive, insightful critiques of King Lear's behavior. And he conveys that through through the pun by comparing one aspect of an egg <laughs> with the way that King Lear is um, executing his, his royal prerogatives. Mm -hmm. So I think that's another really important thing to keep in mind about a pun is that it can be funny, like wit in, in general, but it doesn't have to be. And the connection can be very, very serious. Right. Uh, yeah, and I don't know where... Um, Harold Bloom would rank it. The, I would say the fool is the third wittiest character in in Shakespeare, yeah. and yeah, his his pronouncements are are often hard to understand. If you're seeing the play, you kind of have to read it to understand it and get footnotes to see what he's like referring to. But he's the one only one who recognizes what a uh, awful you know disaster yes. is, is coming. <laughs> uh, so he's definitely the smartest character in that play. Um, yeah. So okay, so let's let's talk a little bit about the. Um, kind of the science of this or, and it, it seems like this is, this is an area that more people are looking at. It's not full, you know, we don't have like a concrete answer yet, but like, you know, why, why is it pleasurable when we like make that connection or get the double meaning? Um, yeah. What is that? Like why, why that, I don't know. Like it doesn't on a surface seem to have sort of a evolutionary adaptation or something that we, you know, find things funny. Um, so what what do what do the the neuroscientists think about this? Yeah, you're you're right. It's um, wit is not something that's studied very often or studied very directly from a neuroscientific point of view. But there are kind of um, insights that you can glean from uh, certain uh, neurodegenerative neuro disorders and things like that that might reveal something about what's going on in the brain. So I think the first to why are puns or jokes or wit, why do we laugh and why is that pleasurable? I think it has something to do with problem solving um, because there is an evolu evolutionary imperative to solve problems. And, if, you know, if you're solving a problem, how to get food or how to find food or improve hunting techniques uh, or, or, or whatever, you know, whatever the primal um, problems that we faced uh, from an evolutionary perspective were, then it makes sense that you would the organism would be rewarded for that because that enhances their chances of survival and to pass on their genes, et cetera, et cetera. So when you successfully solve a problem, a little bit of dopamine gets released in your brain and, and that's pleasurable. And if you think about wit, and especially if you think about it like we've been discussing it, as the ability to make connections whether you're listening to a, a, a pun and trying to figure it out or trying to figure out the punchline to a joke, or if you're in the process of scientific discovery or invention, those can essentially be compared to like solving a riddle. Um, there's a lot of similarities. You're given a bunch of clues and you have to synthesize the information and come to the, the, the right answer. So that's basically problem solving. And getting a pun is like solving a riddle. You're solving a, a problem, a linguistic problem or a semantic problem. Mm -hmm. And I think so that's the relationship between, um, and that too then would release a little bit of dopamine and you get a kick out of <laughs> getting that pun and you would laugh or, or groan or whatever it is. Um, so I think there's the relationship between pleasure and wit and deciphering uh, things. And um, as far as how wit might work in the brain, I think, it again, it has to do with patterns, detecting patterns and creating patterns. And that's what basically the, the human brain does. And I, one current theory is that there's two different um, uh, primary networks in the brain. One is the default network, which is kind of a free associative, uh, associative um, ability of the brain to kind of make, uh, to pay attention to a lot of different things, sort of like when you're 
daydreaming or you let your mind wander or you're kind of riding in a train just looking out the window and letting all kinds of impressions, thoughts and observations pass through your mind. That's the default network and the executive network kicks in when you're focused on a single task like I got to change this tire or I got to finish my math homework or I've got an article deadline to, you know, tomorrow night or I have to prepare for this interview. Um, and I think the default network, that kind of ability of the human mind to um, be open to and process lots of different information at the same time, I think that's where wit happens because wit is paying attention to lots of different things um, from lots of different areas of experience or knowledge and then being able to synthesize those to find the connection to find the pattern and sy synthesize those very different things either into a joke or an invention or some kind of scientific insight or, so or, or something like that or even in your daily life some kind of practical because <laughs> we also have expressions like um, to live by your wits or be at your wits end um, and those all have to do not with being funny but with finding kind of practical solutions to daily problems to live by your wits is to kind of um, be improvisational and ready to respond to unexpected unexpected circumstances and come up with a solution especially when you have few or no resources so I think that default network in the brain which allows us to pay attention to lots of different things and then when we need to to synthesize those into an action a thought something we say something we do that that's where wit I think kicks in from a neurological perspective mm -hmm. um, can you talk about the um, disorder of people who have a brain injury or like <laughs> a, a, a lesion or a brain cancer or something and they start like uh, telling puns or telling jokes nonstop. And... Yeah, <laughs> that's, a, that's an actual medical condition called Witzelsucht, which is a, a German word for basically joke addiction. And um, the German word for wit is Witz. Um, and just like in English, it, it kind of has a double meaning. It means intelligence, but also humor. And people who have this condition, like you say, they've, they've had a stroke or some other kind of neurological damage. And the theory is that what happens is that their executive network, so the, the, um, the circuits in the brain that help focus um, activity and help us concentrate on one thing, and also uh, to some extent constrain the default network and the mind, the, the mind roaming aspect of, of the brain, that the executive network in somehow is damaged in these cases, and then that allows the default network to kind of go into <laughs> warp drive, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And so um, I'm someone who likes to make puns, but I'm also quite aware that not everyone enjoys my puns all the time, <laughs> and not everyone has the same appetite for puns that I do, so I kind of restrain myself. Um, but someone who's suffering from this condition of Witzelsucht because of a brain lesion might not be able to do that. So these are actual documented cases that have been studied, and these people um, just continually make puns all the time, nonstop, or they make, make jokes all the time, nonstop, or they're constantly kind of doing these word associations. And it's, it, in some respects, it's kind of similar to another way to... to to observe it is with um, um, manic depression, for example. In the manic phase, um, people are just have, it's called flight of ideas. They have so many ideas so quickly and they can just um, spout them out very, very quickly and making these really ingenious, brilliant associative leaps from one subject to another, to another, to another, to another. And that's in the manic phase where those uh, the associational networks of the brain just kind of are running wild and not constrained any longer by, by the executive network. So that is kind of, and again, based on um, people with brain damage or uh, similar conditions, it, the way the brain works in its sort of abnormal or, or, or not conventional state um, provides some insight into what wit might be or how wit might work in the brain 
in a in a conventional state. Yeah, it's it's very interesting. There's a um, uh, his name just went out of my head, but the um, the writer and doctor who wrote Awakenings and the man who mistook his wife for a hat. One of his case studies is about Oliver Sacks. Yeah, yeah, Oliver Sacks. Um, uh, one of his case studies is about a patient who has uh, this disorder. Um, so okay, let's get to wit versus humor, which you discussed a little bit in the uh, in your introductory statement. Um, so I, you know, probably, uh, you know, I, as I was reading it, I was thinking like, okay, is someone farting in church, like that's obviously not witty, but that might be very funny, and you know, everyone would laugh or stifle a laugh, and you know, a, a pie in the face, and there's other kind of like low low humor that maybe is not particularly witty uh but you uh, but you also talk about how you know something can be witty and not be funny at all uh so where where do you see the connection or overlap between these two areas yeah um i think those are both good examples of humor of something that's funny that's not witty um and i think the difference is that uh wit can make you laugh but it always makes you think so even if you're laughing at a witty remark you're it's also making you think and if you're laughing at someone farting in church, it's not really making you think. It's not kind of, it doesn't have an intellectual aspect like wit does. Um, so the way, I think the, the best distinction between humor and wit is to look at the, <laughs> the old slapstick um, standard joke. A guy's walking down the street, there's a banana peel on the sidewalk, he steps on the banana peel and he falls on his ass. Everybody laughs. It's a pratfall. It's a kind of standard slapstick joke. It's not witty. Um, there's no kind of intellectual uh, uh, aspect to it. There's no twist to it. There's no kind of reversal. There's nothing special or extra about it. So the witty example of that would be, and this is an actual joke, I think, that uh, Buster Keaton, the great silent film comedian, Buster Keaton kind of adapted in some of his films, Guy's walking down the street. There's a banana peel on the sidewalk. He sees the banana peel, steps over the banana peel, does not fall on his ass, continues walking, turns around to look at the banana peel to admire his accomplishment. And as he do does so, he falls into an open manhole cover. <laughs> so that's witty because it has that twist. It has a reversal. Mm -hmm. It takes... Um, the sort of cliched expected outcome and gives it an entirely new dimension, um, which kind of is, and you can feel it um, when you see it or when you hear something like that, or when you hear a witty remark, you feel your kind of, your brain perks up a little bit. You, yeah. the, there's some kind of intellectual stimulation going on. Whereas if you just, you know, hear someone farting in church or see someone slip on a banana peel, you laugh, but, your mind is not um, getting the same kind of tickle as your as your funny bone is. Mm -hmm. um, I'm reminded of a famous quote that I think is from Mel Brooks: um, "Tragedy is when I cut my finger. Uh, comedy is when you fall into an open manhole and die." <laughs> yes. um, so that's so that kind of places it into yeah. I don't know how that fits in exactly, but like you know, <laughs> seeing someone a bad a bad thing happening to someone else. Um, is potentially funnier than a bad thing happening to yourself. That's kind of, that's kind of obvious. Um, that's your default network at work. <laughs> right. I guess, well, um, this might be a good point. We're talking about people falling, slipping on bananas, peels, and falling into open manholes. To talk about the uh, benign violation theory, which you, you mentioned at one yeah. point, and is the last um, academic theory of humor that I that kind of bu bubbled up to be written about in the popular press. Um, and I think it basically holds that you know, this guy, this researcher is trying to figure out like what what thing does all, does every single joke or humorous situation like what what is the common denominator between them? And so the benign violation is, uh, you know, someone someone if someone if you saw someone actually walking down the street and fall over, you wouldn't probably start laughing. You'd probably like go to help them and check check on them to make sure they were okay. But if you're seeing it in a cartoon or a movie you know that it's not real and everyone is actually fine. And so it's okay to kind of like release the tension <laughs> within you by, by laughing. And then all sorts of other jokes can, or types of jokes can fit into this schema, you know, like dirty jokes are, you know, violate the mores of um, morality. And, but you know, there's no, nothing actually happens. No one's actually hurt. So what do you, what do you think about this? And does this relate to wit? 
Yeah, I think it does. Um, so the benign violation theory of humor states that um, when you violate the expected outcome to a situation, that results in laughter. So the converse example would be a malign violation of expectations. And I think you see that in horror films, you know, when the, the villain's, you know, hideous face suddenly appears and there's a loud screeching noise. That's a malign violation. And it's malign because not only are you surprised, but you also feel physically scared or, or you, that your physical well-being is, is threatened. And a benign violation, like you say, violates your expectations, but um, you're kind of, <laughs> you're going to be okay. You're safe. And um, um, so that I think is, is one, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that that kind of explains all wit or all humor, but it's certainly um, uh, a central component of a lot of wit. And in the book, um, the example I give of this is the, the Roadrunner, Wile E. Coyote and Roadrunner cartoons, which I'm a huge fan of. And Chuck Jones, who um, uh, directed most of those, um, he's, he's a master of benign violations. And... Um, easier to do in a cartoon <laughs> than in right. real life because a lot of those violations have to do with like the laws of gravity and things like that. Um, but there's one scene in particular um, from a Wile E. Coyote cartoon in which Wile E. Coyote paints. He's of course on the edge of a cliff where a road ends right at the edge of a cliff and goes off the edge of the cliff. And he paints a painting that, that depicts the road continuing around the edge of the cliff and the roadrunner comes up, runs into the painting, and goes right around the corner and is completely fine. That's one vi uh, benign violation. So the road, uh, the coyote steps out into the, the road and thinks, what the, what the hell just happened? How is that possible? And as he's standing there, a truck comes from inside the painting and runs him over. That's the second benign violation. And then he gets flattened. He pulls himself up, but that's another violation that always happens in uh, Wile E. Coyote cartoons. No matter what happens to him, he gets, <laughs> he gets up and, and um, uh, keeps going. So he gets up, turns around, going after the, the, the road runner, and he runs into the painting. But suddenly, the expectations that we've been led to have um, previously are reversed again, and he crashes through the painting and falls, falls to the bottom of the um, the abyss. So I think those are great examples of benign violations and they have to do with, you know, similar to the, the banana, uh, banana peel manhole uh, gag. They involve kind of taking what everybody expects and everybody knows and giving it a twist, reversing it, upending it, and in some way kind of just um, subversively undermining um, what we expect to happen and giving it this kind of fresh um, twist that results in, in, in laughter. And again, it has to do with the, the pattern um, finding, pattern making imperative of the human brain, because whenever we're navigating the world, whether it's physical or intellectual, we're always looking for patterns. That's how we, we know what to do. That's how we know what, how to behave and how to respond to events. And so we're always looking for patterns and Manipulating those patterns and twisting them and subverting them is a is a great way to come up with a, a witty gag or a witty remark. Mm -hmm. um, so you you mentioned a couple people and they were obvious, you know, Dorothy Parker and Oscar Wilde. Um, who else do you think are the like great wits of of the last you know five hundred years or so? Oh, only the last five hundred. <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll wall off antiquity for <laughs> another conversation. <laughs> Um, I would say, well, definitely Shakespeare. Um, and again, not because he's so funny, but because his, his wit, his linguistic wit in, in particular, um, uh, is so impressive. Um, I would also say Buster Keaton is probably one of the wittiest people ever to have walked the face of the earth. And I really would encourage everybody to have a look at his classic silent film shorts from the 19 teens and the 1920s in particular. He's a master, and, and he's also a great example of um, wit not only being verbal, but it can be visual, it can be physical. He's a great physical comedian, and he, he never says a word. Um, you mentioned uh, Madame de Stal, who's uh, 
in the, the dialogue with Denis Diderot in, in the chapter that's written as the scene from a play. She was a French uh, intellectual from late 18th, early 19th century. She was, uh, and one of the great, um, during the, you know, the height of the Paris salon, where brilliant people would come together and have scintillating conversation. She was a great, great uh, wit herself and um, a huge intellectual force, both in, in conversation and in kind of political thinking uh, for, for her period. And I think wit today, um, <laughs> you know, uh, if you think about Twitter, uh, it's got the word wit in it, <laughs> but it also has the word twit in it. And um, uh, I think Twitter can be a really great um, vehicle for, for wit and some of the best, the wittiest things that, that I've seen uh, on social media, Twitter and other other social media are like memes that get created in response to um, news events. So I think that's like a spontaneous expression of wit where, you know, whether it's uh, the government shutdown or the Brett Kavanaugh Supreme Court hearings or, or whatever, um, there's this kind of collective witty mind out there mm -hmm. and people are so fast in coming up with the great gif to, to kind of make fun of some political event or some, uh, you know, statement by a politician or something like that. So I think wit is still um, very much alive and well today, and I don't think the only examples of wit can can be found in Shakespeare time. I think it's it's happening; it's all around us. And the title of my book, Wit's End, is not um, it's a pun. <laughs> I'm sorry to say, um, and you know it can mean on the one hand the end of wit, but it also means, and that's the the, the meaning that I'm most interested in is the purpose of wit wit's end um what is the to what end do we have wit and i think um that's the what i explore and celebrate in the book mm -hmm. yeah I, yeah twitter is <laughs> it contains multitudes and but you can see a lot of very very funny stuff on there and that's one of the main reasons i stay on there and um yeah think about you know me memes is like the modern form of wit i mean it it's like communal and participatory in a way that previous ones weren't, you know, there are only so many seats at the Algonquin round table and they wouldn't just let anyone co come in. Whereas if you can, you know, use basic photo editing software, you can, uh, you know, add on to a meme and extend its life. And there, there've been some pretty good ones. Uh, the distracted yeah. boyfriend. Yeah. Have you seen that one? That was, that was one of the top ones of the last year or so. Uh, we'll include a link to it. It was like a stock photography of uh, <laughs> street scene, um, guy is walking down with his girlfriend and there's another woman who is approaching the camera out of focus. The guy is turning his head around to check out the woman and the girlfriend is looking at the boyfriend in shock and dismay. And, and somehow it just, so people just started labeling the different things of like, it's basically like you're going from one thing to the next. Um, and Absolutely. you know, people have, I've seen like at least a thousand variations on the same very, very basic thing that captured people's imagination. Um, yeah. So, so there, you have a chapter in here on uh, rap, as you mentioned, and there's also a chapter on jive, um, and then there's a chapter that's kind of um, Talmudic dispute, dis commentary and disputation. Um, <laughs> so I it, it got me thinking, like, so you know, there's a well known um, like thing called Jewish humor, Jewish comedy, and um, there's all sorts of books about about it. Um, one of which that came out recently, I tried to read and couldn't get through because it was too boring. Um, <laughs> but I won't, I won't mention. But How much do you want to hear about a, a book about <laughs> Jewish humor? Um, but then, yeah, and then you also mentioned basically African American, um, you know, cultural production, uh, and it you know made me think like, is there is there something about being a subordinated group that has suffered that like leads you to use wit as your your way to get back um, at the at the power structure? Yeah, I think, um, yeah, that's not an uncommon theory of humor and why certain um, groups have specific types of humor. Um, I come from an Irish background, and the Irish were also at one point a, a persecuted uh, group. And the Irish also have a very distinctive form of, of humor, um, very kind of verbal, voluble um, kind of humor. 
So I think there is something to that, and but I don't think it explains everything. Or if you're not part of a persecuted group or oppressed, or um, that you don't have humor, or that all humor from uh, oppressed groups is the same. Um, but what I think it has to do with is, and I think this is a, another power of wit, um, uh, and it actually kind of relates to memes and Twitter culture and things like that, is that, you know, whatever is happening, um, so for, for, for groups that are disempowered or, or, or powerless, you know, what is the thing that you still control? And that is your, your mind, your brain and your um, reaction and response to events, you know, things that are happening or things that are happening to you. And I think your mind and your brain um, is a very, very potent um, force. So, and this is where you see kind of satire um, and parody come into play. Um, so for example, um, I've got a, a, an issue that's currently in the news and very, very controversial is, you know, what to do with Confederate monuments. And the, the debate is, do we leave them in place and provide historical context? It's um, even though it's a part of a shameful part of our, our history, it's one that we need to recognize and deal with. Should they be removed because they glorify white supremacy? That's a perfectly legitimate um, debate. The same kind of debate took place in the post-Soviet Union um, countries, uh, you know, in the late 1980s, early 90s, where there was all kinds of Stalin statues and um, other paraphernalia from uh, the Soviet Union. And what happened in some cases there was that people left the statues in place, but then they modified them and made fun of them. And... You know, so they would, whether it was what was graffiti or um, kind of remove, making select selective removals of uh, part of the statue. Like there was one uh, statue of Stalin. They took off everything but his boots <laughs> and they just left the boots on this uh, plinth. And it was just hilarious because, you know, it, <laughs> it, it just looks ridiculous. And... There was one case uh, just recently, I forget where it was, but somewhere in the South, where a Confederate overnight, someone put googly eyes on a statue of a conf Confederate yeah, journal, yeah. A general. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, that is the power of parody. That is the power of witty satire. And that's coming from, you know, uh, groups that are disempowered or feel powerless. They still have... And, they still have the power to um, and and the wit <laughs> to um, to use the, the 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 one weapon that they they still have, and that's their 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 sense of humor, their sense of uh, ridicule, and you know you see that everywhere. Um, and today, for you know people who feel disempowered um, by the current political situation in in the U.S., it's a it's a it's a heyday for political satire. You know, just turn on the late night comedians and you'll get uh, as much political satire <laughs> as you could probably handle. Uh, that was also true in uh, Soviet times. And people like Stanislav Letz, who I mentioned uh, earlier, he was uh, f famous in Central Europe uh, as, a, as a political dissident. And he expressed his uh, political opinions and his dissidents in aphorisms and uh, in wit and kind of barbed remarks that uh, kind of take on the power structure by ridiculing it. And I think that's, um, you know, that's one way that uh, resistance takes place. And I think that's one way that resistance creates political social change by softening up um, the, the target of that satire through um, witty ridicule and exposing um, the intellectual or personal failings of, of the power structure. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, I, I'm reminded of one thing I did uh, take from that book I previously mentioned on the history of Jewish humor was um, that uh, uh, 
scholars have found that jokes were told in concentration camps and have recorded some of them. Um, yeah. And, you know, there's, so that's, that was a form of, you know, resistance or, to, or just to see that, you know, people, when people are reduced to, to their most, they're still able to, um, yeah. to make jokes and, and, you know, get something, some, you know, psychic benefit from that. Um, yeah. Dark humor and gallows humor is, is very much related to that. And you can, make the argument that it's when you know you're at your lowest that you need wit the most because wit is it reaffirms that you're you control your own mind and that's like the the last thing that you may be able to, certainly in a concentration camp uh, that's the you know the only thing that that is still yours and i think you know we all f find ourselves in situations where we feel powerless where we feel helpless whether that's you know personal loss in, in the sense of a loved one dying or something like that, where wit and humor kind of brings a little bit of lightness and also creates a bond. I think that's the other thing um, that's really important to note about um, wit and parody and humor is that it's not, it can be a sort of aggressive tactic to ridicule and, and um, decrease someone else's power or to attack a power structure, but it also creates a bond within a community. Um, that is brought together by that shared kind of sense of um, empowerment through uh, opposition. So I think that's uh, another really important positive, uh, you know, upside of, of wit and humor during dark times. Mm -hmm. um, do you have a favorite witticism or joke that <laughs> you think best exemplifies? The <laughs> Best exemplifies. Well, you know the ability of wit. You mentioned the one about the snowflake and the avalanche, which is I never heard before and was is very striking. Um, but yeah, that's not a ha ha kind of one exactly. Um, is there is there one that you, that you would call your favorite or too too hard to pick? Yeah, no, I, I've got lots of favorites, um, but there's one. You know, there's a couple that I I always come back to. Um, Stanislav Letts is one, but there's also uh, an American author, a contemporary of Mark Twain guy named Josh Billings. He's largely forgotten today, but um, he and Mark Twain were contemporaries and friends, and he was just as famous, if not more famous, than Mark Twain was when, when they were both alive. And he um, wrote essays, he worked as a journalist, and he was a humorist like Mark Twain and gave lectures and things like that. He's also a great aphorist, and uh, some of his um, aphorisms, I think, speak to what we were just talking about. I don't, <laughs> I'm not a big fan of self-help um, literature, but certainly um, aphorisms and sayings and, and wit is something that can come to your rescue when you, when you are feeling powerless and helpless and, and when you're feeling down. And one of his um, aphorisms I always think of when I'm faced with particularly difficult, challenging situations, and that is this, be like a postage st stamp Stick to one thing until you get there. <laughs> I think that's that's really witty and also kind of very optimistic. Yeah, that is a nice one. Um, okay, maybe maybe the last question. Um, so your um, your bio in the back here uh, shows you juggling and it mentions also that that you are a juggler. Um, so you must be a pretty hardcore juggler if you wanted it if you wanted it to be uh, featured in your author photo there. Um, I'm a uh, very amateur juggler. I taught myself in middle school or high school from the Klutz book, but I haven't really <laughs> passed that point. Um, do you Great see, book. is there something witty about juggling? Is there a connection there? I mean, there's no, usually juggling is part of a like comedic performance that, you know, <laughs> yeah. there's not like, I don't know if there's like a sad juggling, if that's, if that's, <laughs> if that's possible or not. Um, yeah. No. Do, you see, do you see a connection there? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, I, I consider myself an amateur juggler as well, a very avid one, but, um, you know, I, I can't juggle seven balls or, or you know, flaming torches or, or anything like that. Um, but I do juggle and have juggled for decades. And um, when I do talks, uh, you know, I do talks about the book and about wit, and it, I always juggle at the end. And at the end, I explain what juggling has to do um, with wit. And I think it's what we talked about at the beginning. It's um, when you're juggling, you've got these balls in the air and somehow you manage to keep them all going at the same time. And um, that I think is a great visual representation, a visual uh, metaphor for what wit is. Um, 
like we were talking uh, about earlier, I think wit involves making connections among different things that are kind of from wildly different areas of knowledge or information or experience, and then somehow uh, bringing those things together and combining them in ways that is kind of new and fresh and surprising and novel and funny or enlightening uh, or refreshing. And I think when you watch someone juggling, that's exactly what a juggler does. He's got uh, these balls and they're, they're all in the air at the same time. And it looks kind of, you know, how is that possible? And then when juggler does a trick and does a twist or behind the back or something like that, it's just like, ah, you know, you get this kind of physical sensation of wow. And I think that's a kind of, like I said, a visual metaphor for, for what happens in your brain um, uh, when wit is happening in your brain. You've got these things going on and you're able, just like a pun, is essentially you're juggling different meanings of words. And then suddenly you bring them all together and you get the pun or you get the joke. And I think, you know, in our <laughs> when we're being witty, um, and I think everyone is witty, it's not a special characteristic that only people like Oscar Wilde or Dorothy Parker have, but it's something that everybody has. That's what's happening in our brain. We're juggling in our brains. That's interesting. Um... Yeah, I wonder. I, I, it may be impossible for them to like do the CT scan of what's going on in someone's <laughs> brain as they're juggling. But right. when I'm juggling it, it is some. I don't know if it's like a flow state or how you would define it. But it's you're kind of you. It takes concentration, but you're you're um, looking at things that are in the corners of your eyes and trying to keep things going. And there's like a uh, you know, it's definitely mental effort and physical effort combined. So <laughs> I don't yeah. so I don't know if this if this is default mode or executive executive yeah, mode no, when you're when you're doing it. It's definitely default mode. Um because when you're juggling you're not looking at any one ball. If you were looking at balls individually, you would never be able to catch them mm -hmm. or keep them in the air. You're looking at your whole field of vision when you're juggling. And because you're not paying attention to any one thing, you're paying attention to everything. That's what enables you to make those connections, to make those catches, to create those patterns. It's exactly the same thing uh, with wit in the brain. Okay, I think that's a good place um, to close. So you're getting the book, uh, Wit's End. Uh, there'll be links below. Um, are there other places? So you said you are on Twitter. Do you have a? Do you want to share? Your yeah, I'm on handle? Twitter. Yeah, at James Geary. Um, I have a blog on my web website, jamesgeary.com. Um, so yeah, check it out. Okay, cool. Um, and you can follow me on Twitter at uh, R-E-A-C-W. That's A-R-Y-H-C-W. Um, so uh, thank you, James, for coming on. And thank you to all of our viewers and listeners. And we'll see you next time.